This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 61. Coming up on Space Time. Andromeda's galactic cannibalism uncovered. The first evidence for a young star consuming a planet. And Great Britain to build its own spaceport in Scotland. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered that the Andromeda Galaxy M31, the largest galaxy in the Milky Way's local galactic group, shredded and cannibalized a galaxy similar to the Milky Way about 2 billion years ago. Even though it was mostly shredded, the remains of this decimated galaxy have provided astronomers with a rich trail of evidence, including an almost invisible halo of stars larger than the Andromeda Galaxy itself, an elusive stream of stars, and an enigmatic compact galaxy known as M32. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, will help scientists better understand how disk galaxies like the Milky Way and Andromeda evolve over time, and how they survive large merger events. The now-disrupted galaxy, named M32p, was the third largest member of the local group of galaxies, after Andromeda, the largest, and the second largest, the Milky Way. Using computer models, scientists were able to piece together this evidence, revealing that the cannibalized galaxy was a long-lost sibling of the Milky Way. Scientists have long known that this nearly invisible large halo of stars surrounding galaxies contains the remnants of smaller cannibalized galaxies. A galaxy like Andromeda was expected to have consumed hundreds of its smaller companions. Researchers thought this would make it difficult to learn about any single one of them. But using new computer simulations, scientists were able to understand that even though many companion galaxies were consumed by Andromeda, it seems most of the stars in Andromeda's outer faint halo were mostly contributed by the shredding of just one single large galaxy. The study's lead author, Richard D'Souza from the University of Michigan, describes it as a eureka moment. It was then they realized they could use this information from Andromeda's outer stellar halo to infer the properties of the largest of these shredded galaxies. Astronomers have been studying the local group, the Milky Way, Andromeda and their companions, for a long time. And the authors say it was quite shocking to realize that the Milky Way had a large sibling that scientists never even knew existed. This galaxy, M32p, which was shredded by the Andromeda galaxy, was at least 20 times larger than any galaxy that had merged with or been cannibalized by the Milky Way. M32p would have been massive, making it the third largest galaxy in the local group after Andromeda and the Milky Way. The research will also serve to solve a long-standing mystery, namely the formation of Andromeda's enigmatic M32 satellite galaxy. The research suggests that the compact and dense nature of M32 indicates that it's probably the galactic centre of the Milky Way's long-lost sibling, M32p. The study's co-author, Eric Bell, also from the University of Michigan, describes M32 as a real galactic weirdo. While it looks like a compact example of an old elliptical galaxy, it actually has lots of young stars, something elliptical galaxies normally don't have. He says it's one of the most compact galaxies in the known universe, and there isn't another galaxy quite like it. Overall, this study is really significant because it could be altering science's traditional understanding of how galaxies evolve. You see, the researchers realized that Andromeda's disk somehow survived an impact with this massive galaxy M32p. It questions the common wisdom that such large interactions would destroy the galactic disks of spiral galaxies, resulting in the creation of an elliptical galaxy. The timing of the merger could also explain the thickening of the disk of Andromeda's galaxy, as well as a burst of star formation in Andromeda which occurred about 2 billion years ago. Understanding how what we now know as the Andromeda galaxy and its satellite M32 formed will go a long way towards unravelling the mysteries of galaxy formation. The method used in this study can also be used for other galaxies, permitting measurements of their most massive galaxy mergers. With this knowledge, scientists can better untangle the complicated web of cause and effect which drives galaxy growth and learn more about what mergers really do to galaxies. Right now, Andromeda is located about 2.5 million light years from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, but it's closing in on us fast. And so these findings will provide new insights into what the Milky Way can expect when Andromeda collides and cannibalizes it in about 3.7 billion years from now. Andromeda contains over a trillion stars and spans more than 220,000 light-years. 
By comparison, the smaller Milky Way is estimated to contain somewhere around 400 billion stars, spanning about 180,000 light years across. While most studies have suggested Andromeda is at least two to three times the mass of the Milky Way, more recent measurements suggest they may be closer in mass than previously thought. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists may have for the first time observed the destruction of a young planet or planets by their host star. The observations from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory indicate that the parent star is now in the process of devouring the planetary debris. The discovery gives fresh insight into the processes affecting the survival of infant planets. Since 1937, astronomers have puzzled over the curious variability of a young star named RW or A, located about 450 light years from Earth. Every few decades, the star's optical light has faded briefly before brightening again. In recent years, astronomers have observed the star dimming more frequently and for longer periods. Astronomers using Chandra may finally have uncovered what caused the star's most recent dimming events. They suggest a collision between two infant planetary bodies, including one at least large enough to be a full-sized planet, could be to blame. The collision destroyed both planets, and the resulting planetary debris has fallen into the star, generating a thick veil of dust and gas, temporarily obscuring the star's light. The study's lead author, Hans Moritz Gunzer from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, says computer simulations have long predicted that planets can fall into young stars. But if correct, this would be the first time that astronomers have actually directly observed such an event taking place. The star's previous dimming events may well have been caused by similar such planetary smash-ups, either involving two planetary bodies or large remnants of past collisions that had met head-on and broken apart again. RW or A is located in the Taurus Riga dark clouds, which host stellar nurseries containing thousands of infant stars. Unlike our relatively mature Sun, very young stars are still surrounded by rotating disks of gas and clumps of material, ranging in size from small dust grains to pebbles, some of which have already grown large enough to become fledgling protoplanets. It's thought these protoplanetary disks can last for between 5 and 10 million years. RW or A is estimated to only be a few million years old, and so is still surrounded by these disks of dust and gas. And both contain about the same mass as the Sun. The notable dips in the optical brightness of RW or A, which occurred every few decades, each lasted for about a month. But then in 2011, the behaviour suddenly changed. The star dimmed again, this time for about six months. The star did eventually brighten, only to fade again in mid-2014. In November 2016, the star returned to its full brightness, but then in January 2017, it dimmed again. Chandra was used to observe the star during an optically bright period in 2013, and then dim periods in 2015 and 2017, when decreases in X-rays were also observed. Because the X-rays come from the hot outer atmosphere of the star, changes in the X-ray spectrum, that is the intensity of X-rays measured at different wavelengths over these three observations, were used to probe the density and composition of the absorbing material around the star. The team found that the dips in both optical and X-ray light are being caused by dense gas obscuring the star's light. The observations in 2017 also showed strong emission from iron atoms, indicating that the disk contained at least 10 times more iron than during the 2013 observations during a bright period. Günther and colleagues suggest the excess iron was created when two planetesimals, or infant planetary bodies, collided. If one or both of the bodies were made partially of iron, their smash-up would have released large amounts of iron into the star's disk, temporarily obscuring its light as material falls into the star. A less favoured explanation is that small grains or particles such as iron can become trapped in parts of the disk. If the disk's structure changes suddenly, such as when the star's partner passes close by, the resulting tidal forces might release the trapped particles, creating an excess of iron that can fall into the star. The authors are hoping to make more observations of the star in the future to see whether the amount of iron surrounding it has changed, a measure that could help researchers determine the size of the iron source. For example, if about the same amount of iron appears in a year or two, then that may indicate it's coming from a relatively massive source. A lot of efforts currently going into learning about exoplanets and how they form. So astronomers see it as important to see how young planets could be destroyed in interactions with their host stars and with other young planets, and what factors will determine whether they survive or not. 
After all, we know that 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth had a similar sort of interaction with an object about the size of Mars. It managed to survive, in the process creating our Moon. The study is reported in the Astronomical Journal. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Britain has announced plans to build its own spaceport at Sutherland on the north coast of Scotland. The project will be part of a £50 million UK spaceflight program, which includes initial funding of £2.5 million towards the Scottish Government's Highlands and Islands enterprise to develop a vertical launch site in consultation with Lockheed Martin, who will provide integration and launch services. The new facility will initially launch small orbital rockets, carry micro-satellites or up to six large six-unit CubeSat payloads. As well as the Sutherland site at Melness, an additional £2 million will provide seed fundings for proposals for horizontal launch systems based at New Keene, Cornwall, at Glasgow Presswick and in Snedonia. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for August on Skywatch. August is the eighth month of the year in both the Julian and Gregorian calendars. It was originally named Sextilis in Latin because it was the sixth month of the original 10-month Roman calendar under Romulus in 753 BCE. It only became the eighth month when January and February were added to the year before March. In the year 8 BCE, Sextilis was renamed August in honour of the Roman statesman and military leader Augustus, who had achieved several of his greatest triumphs, including the conquest of Egypt, during this month. The constellation Scorpius the Scorpion is high overhead, covering almost a third of the August night skies. The heart of the Scorpion is marked by the red supergiant Antares. Located some 470 light years away, Antares means the rival of Mars. And when they're close together in the sky, they certainly look very similar. Antares, or Alpha Scorpi, has some 12.4 times the mass and 450 times the diameter of our Sun, and is one of the largest known stars in the universe. In fact, if it were placed where the Sun is at the centre of our solar system, Antares would engulf the inner planets Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, with its outer surface reaching almost as far as the orbit of Jupiter. Antares has a companion star, Antares B. It's a massive spectral type B blue-white star, with at least 7.2 times the mass of the Sun and at least 5.2 times the Sun's radius. Antares B is located about 224 astronomical units beyond the primary star. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Sun and the Earth, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. Located near Antares is the globular cluster Messier 4 or M4 for short. Named after the 18th century French astronomer and comet hunter Charles Messier, it's one of a catalogue of 103 fuzzy objects that were not comets, which Messier listed simply so he didn't have to waste his time looking at them. Other astronomers have since added further celestial objects to the catalogue, bringing the total number to around 110. Located about 7,000 light years away, M4 is one of the closest globular clusters to Earth, close enough to be identified through a pair of backyard binoculars. Globular clusters are densely packed spheres of thousands of gravitationally bound stars, which were all originally born at the same time in the same stellar nursery. They're usually extremely ancient, as old as some galaxies, dating back to around 12 billion years. Now, sticking with Scorpius and looking towards the sting of its tail, you'll see two other star clusters, these ones open clusters, called M7 and M6. The nearer of the two, M7, is only 800 light years away, while M6 is a more distant 2,000 light years away. Open star clusters are less densely packed than their globular cluster counterparts with the stars inside them less gravitationally bound to each other and therefore more prone to drift away over time. Another open star cluster in Scorpius is NGC 6231, located about 6,500 light years away near the star Zeta Scorpi. NGC 6231 is a bright open star cluster containing around 120 stars, including a significant population of high luminosity supergiants. There are also numerous white yellow stars, and at least two Wolf Rayet stars. Wolf Rayets are extremely hot, luminous evolved stars nearing the end of their lives. Having run out of hydrogen for core fusion, Wolf Rayet stars are no longer on the main sequence and are fusing progressively heavier and heavier elements in their cores, 
generating hot, powerful stellar winds and surface temperatures of up to 200,000 degrees. That compares with the sun's surface temperature of just 5,800 degrees Celsius. Just behind Scorpius is the constellation Sagittarius, the half-man, half-horse of Greek mythology. Sagittarius can be traced back beyond the Greeks to the ancient Mesopotamian archer god Nurgle. As we mentioned in last month's Skywatch, the centre of the Milky Way galaxy is found in Sagittarius, some 27,000 light years away. Sagittarius is known for its nebulae and clusters more than any other constellation. One of the largest and brightest is the globular cluster M22, big enough to be visible to the unaided eye. Located about 10,600 light years away near the galactic bulge, M22 is more elliptical than most globular clusters. It's located on the celestial sphere just south of the ecliptic, the imaginary plane in the sky upon which all the planets, including the Earth, orbit the Sun. M22 contains around 70,000 stars, covering an area of at least 100 light years. It also contains at least two black holes, and it's one of just a handful of globular clusters known to contain a planetary nebula, the puffed off outer gaseous envelope of a dead sun-like star. Located in the sky next to Scorpius in the west and Sagittarius in the east is the constellation Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, often portrayed as a snake coiled around a man. In Greek mythology, it's Ophiuchus who raises Orion from the dead after he's bitten by Scorpius. Ophiuchus contains several star clusters and other interesting features, including Barnard Star. Barnard Star is the second nearest star system to the Sun, beaten only in distance by the Alpha Centauri triple star system. Located some 5.9 light years away, Barnard Star is a spectral type M red dwarf, only about 0.144 times the mass of the Sun. At somewhere between 7 and 12 billion years of age, Barnard Star is considerably older than the Sun, which is about 4.6 billion years old. In fact, Barnard Star may be one of the oldest stars in the Milky Way galaxy. It's lost a great deal of its rotational energy, and the periodic slight changes in its brightness indicate it's rotating about once every 130 days. By comparison, the Sun rotates roughly every 27 Earth days. Given its age, Barnard Star was long assumed to be quiescent in terms of stellar activity. But in 1998, astronomers observed an intense stellar flare, indicating it's a flare star. Flare stars are variable stars that undergo unpredictable dramatic increases in brightness for just a few minutes. It's believed that the flares on flare stars are analogous to solar flares on the Sun, in that they're generated by stellar magnetic energy stored in the star's atmosphere. Lying just to the west of Scorpius is the constellation Libra, the scales. In Greek mythology, Libra represents the claws of Scorpius the scorpion. However, the Romans considered Libra to be distinct from Scorpius and thought them to be the scales symbolising the equinoxes, the times of the year in March and September when Earth gets equal hours of day and night. You see, 2,000 years ago, the Sun moved into Libra at the time of the September equinox. But due to precession as the Earth's spin axis wobbles in direction, this point in time has now moved into the adjoining constellation of Virgo. OK, turning to the south now and towards the Southern Cross, you'll see the constellation Centaurus, another half-man, half-horse type mythical beast. In ancient mythology, Centaurus was the teacher of many of the Greek gods and heroes. He was placed among the stars of the heavens after accidentally being killed by a poisoned arrow fired by Hercules. Close to the pointer star Beta Centauri lies NGC 5139 Omega Centauri, the largest and brightest globular cluster in the visible sky. Because of its brightness, the ancient Greek mathematician and astronomer Claudius Ptolemy originally thought Omega Centauri was a star. It has a diameter of over 150 light years and contains an estimated 10 million stars, giving it some 4 million times the mass of the Sun. Located 15,800 light years away, Omega Centauri is another very ancient globular cluster, thought to be around 12 billion years old. As such, it contains many population 2 stars. These were the very second generation of stars to have formed, created directly out of the remains of the very first stars to shine in the universe. The stars in the core of Omega Centauri are so crowded together that they're estimated to only be separated by an average of 0.1 light years from each other. Now, by comparison, Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to the Sun, is some 4.23 light years distant. 
Close to Omega Centauri is the giant lenticular galaxy NGC 5128, better known as Centaurus A, which to our eyes looks like it's being split in half by a thick band of dust. The galaxy was discovered back in 1826 by the astronomer James Dunlop from his home in what is now the Sydney suburb of Parramatta. Needless to say, that's a long time before the bright lights of a modern city would make such a discovery from that location impossible. Located some 13 million light years away, Centaurus A is one of the strongest radio sources in the sky. It's thought to be the result of a merger between an elliptical and a spiral galaxy. You should be able to see it through a pair of binoculars, but you'll need a telescope to make out its spectacular dust lanes. August is also the time of the peak for the annual Perseids meteor shower. Meteors are in fact the debris trail left behind by the comet Swift Tuttle as it travels along its 133-year orbit through our solar system. The Perseids radiant, that's the point in the sky from which the meteors appear to originate, lies in the constellation Perseus. The Perseids are one of the oldest known meteor showers, identified in early Chinese historical records for its activity going back almost 2,000 years. They're active from July the 17th to August the 24th, with a peak occurring on August the 12th with about 60 meteors an hour usually being visible. The Perseids are also very bright and fast-moving meteors, travelling at speeds of 59 kilometres per second. They're best seen between midnight and just before dawn, producing long bright trails and some fireballs. Perseids usually burn up in the atmosphere at altitudes over 80 kilometres. They're best seen from northern hemisphere skies, so for southern hemisphere sky watchers, look to the north with a radiant below the northern horizon. And now with a look at the rest of the August night skies, we're joined by Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. Good day, Stuart. Gee, you know, we've been having some really great stargazing weather lately, haven't we? The the wintertime here in Australia at the moment is absolutely beautiful, clear skies, not too cold, just perfect, and there's lots of stuff to see. In the evening sky at the moment, uh, we find the Milky Way. It's stretching all the way across the sky from the northeast to the southwest. The centre of the Milky Way in the region of the constellation Sagittarius is pretty much directly overhead for those of us at uh, roughly the latitude of Sydney at the moment. This is one of the reasons why uh, astronomers you know, like to do stuff in the Southern Hemisphere because we can see the, the centre of our galaxy nice and high, which is uh, where you want to be viewing. You don't want to be viewing things down near the horizon because you're looking through too much murk in the atmosphere. So having the galactic centre up nice and high is really good. You don't get that view from the northern half of the planet, unfortunately. They really can't see Sagittarius very well. Down south, the Southern Cross is nice and high in the southwestern sky at the moment, flying on its right-hand side. Remembering that the Southern Cross looks like a, a kite shape rather than a plus symbol. That's the cross we're talking about. Above it, a pair of stars known as the two pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri. You really can't miss them or, or the cross. They're really bright and prominent down in the south. If you're a morning person, you're up in the morning, you're looking around, uh, there's plenty to see in the eastern half of the sky, including the constellation Orion, the Hunter, which I think is our favourite, both our favourite constellations. Uh, that yeah. and the Southern Cross I use as my go-to points when I first look at the sky so I know where I am and where everything else will be. That's right. You can really orientate yourself north, south, uh, east, west, that kind of thing by looking at those ones. So Orion the Hunter, yes, so it's got its bright stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse, and it's easy to see a group of three stars in a row which form the belt of Orion the Hunter, the mythological figure. A little way around to the right or the south of Orion, you'll find Sirius, the star Sirius. That's the brightest star in the night sky. It's in the southern half of the sky, so we can see it uh, really nicely and easily from down here in Australia. A little further around to the right, uh, going towards the south, is the star Canopus, which is the second brightest star in the sky. Now, as far as the planets go, you can see four of them at the moment in the evening sky, so that's good. You don't have to get up, stay up too late or get up too early in the morning. Out to the west after sunset, look in the west, that's where the sun sets, uh, you'll see a bright star about a third of the way up from the horizon. That's not actually a star, that's the planet Venus, and you really can't miss it because it is so bright. Now, higher above it, go up about another third of the way up the sky, so about two-thirds of the way up the sky, is uh, Jupiter, the planet Jupiter. Again, it just looks like a really big bright star, but it's actually a planet. If you have a pair of binoculars, even small ones, take a look. You should be able to make out up to four tiny pinpricks of light near the planet, either one side or the other, or two on one side and two on the other, or whatever. These are its four biggest moons, the ones that Galileo first saw when he made his uh, first telescope. So when you look at Jupiter, if you've got a chance through a pair of binoculars or a telescope, you're looking at exactly what Galileo saw for the first time, which set off this whole scientific revolution. Now, high overhead at around about 9 p.m., from roughly the latitude of Sydney or Melbourne, you'll find the planet Saturn. 
And if you get a chance to look at it through a telescope this time rather than binoculars, do so because you'll be able to see its rings and just everyone's always amazed when they see the ring planet and it's really quite spectacular. It looks just what it looks like in the pictures. Over in the eastern half of the sky, you'll see a bright orangey red looking star but again, it's not a star. This is the planet Mars. Uh, Mars has been in the news the last few weeks, of course, because uh, we're in the season at the moment to see the red planet really well, because at the end of July, Earth and Mars passed each other in space in their respective orbits. We we're on the inside orbit, so we were sort of overtaking Mars. And, and we yeah, came to our closest point together, which happens every couple of years. Not too close. It's more than 50 million kilometres, but that makes a difference when you're looking at a planet uh, as small as Mars because uh, it makes it, you know, the closer it is, the bigger it's going to appear, basically. Now, if you're having trouble figuring out which of these points of light are these four planets, well, you can actually use the moon to help guide you because as the moon goes around the sky every four weeks, it passes each of these planets in turn. And sometimes you can find it right next to the planet or a little bit away. Um, that's just a line of sight effect. In space, they're not really close together. It's just that they're in the same sort of direction as we see them. So go out and have a look on August the 14th, for instance, and you'll see the moon very close to Venus, right? That makes it easy to work out which one's Venus. A few days later, on the 17th, you'll see the moon right next to Jupiter. A few days later again, on the 21st, it'll appear very close to Saturn. And on the 23rd, it's going to appear just beside Mars. So that's a really easy way to find the planets. If you know when the moon's going to be near them, just go out on that night and you think, ah, oh, that one's Saturn, or ah, oh, that one's Mars, okay. And you go out the next night, you'll find the moon has moved, but the planet will be basically in the same spot. So there you go, Stuart. That's what's in the sky for August. That's Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 